Hello, and welcome to the next episode of Lost in Criterion. I'm John Patrick Owitare Dorgan, and with me is a man who used to sell penicillin that was diluted with water to orphans and then ran through the tunnels of France. Oh, no, sorry, Vienna. I got confused. Yes, for some it's reason, Austria, I kept being, not France. I know, for some reason, I know that. They're speaking German. I'm listening to German. I understand <laughs> what's going on. And then, yet, my brain kept jumping to France. I don't know why. Yeah... It happens. It's post-war Europe. You just expect intrigue-ish things to be happening in in France. Exactly. There's not a lot of movies that... I can't think of a lot of movies that take place in Vienna. I don't think I've ever seen one. Well, not, not, not sure a post-war film. Either. I'm sure I've seen other well, films yeah. in Vienna, but... This week we were talking about The Third Man, uh, directed by Carol Reed, uh, produced by David Selznick, written by Graham Greene in 1949, starring Orson Welles, but don't uh, don't tell anyone that before they watch it the first time, um, <laughs> and also Joseph Cotton in the in the principal role, uh, the the protagonist role. Well, yeah, I mean, it's in the uh, title card. Let me repeat that a few times. That well, Orson yeah, but, in I mean, the film. And they just go, yes, where exactly. is he? Where's Orson Welles? Uh, why isn't he here? He's in the uh, background Orson of one is, shot. Orson Welles is the, is the title character. Uh, yes. The titular character. Yes, thank you for, 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 the, for saying titular. <laughs> hmm, I love saying titular. <laughs> this, all right, let's, so just, the, let's just pack it up. No. <laughs> <laughs> no, we're not done. This is, this is one of my favorite movies of all time. This is... The first movie from the Criterion Collection that I ever owned, uh, I have unfortunately had to sell it since, a fact I would not have done if I weren't very hungry, uh, and also... That drug um, habit. No, 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 no drug habit. My, my habits aren't drug-related, they're related to being poor and needing to keep a house, an internet connection, mm. and food. Yeah, all of which are essential. All of which are essential to my modern life. Um, the internet connection, not necessarily so, but when we're doing this, it yeah, certainly this wouldn't helps be happening to have one at home. Yeah, I'd be doing it in a park somewhere, I'm sure. <laughs> Yelling at a bunch of people nice in Starbucks about, to be quiet. One nice thing about Columbus is they do have uh, public Wi-Fi in some areas outside, so I wouldn't have to sit in a Starbucks and yell You could people. buy a tent and sit in the tent <laughs> in the park. I could buy a tent and sit in a tent in the Starbucks. <laughs> Which would and, be... But I don't know if it would get quieter or louder because you did that. I don't know. I don't know. Uh, so, yes, this is this is a movie I have watched multiple times. This is a movie, Pat, this is your first time watching yes, it. Yes, I've only watched it the one time, and I will cop to it right now. I did not do a good job. <laughs> Aww. Due to circumstances beyond my control, I only really was uh. able to give this, like... 60% of my attention or 70% of my attention. So, I'm just going to be carrying most of this. And if I say something well, incorrect... I, I'll, I'll be sure to yeah, pounce you. on you and correct yeah. you. Uh, I will say, though, watching it this time, uh, there were a few things that I had never noticed or at least never processed before. And maybe it's just the mindset I'm watching it now after, after what, 38 other... Uh, <laughs> Yeah, uh, well, well, not thirty-eight. What episode is? This? I have no idea. It's it's definitely not thirty-eight. No, it's, it's way uh, past thirty-eight, isn't it? It's sixty. It's sixty-four. Yeah, yeah. I think yeah. um, we've done well, no, we've done the sixty-three other times. You so. start learning to watch movies in a little bit different way than yeah. Well, well for me, mostly looking for problems and things I don't like because I'm a, <laughs> a grumpy a grumpy uh, grouch. But you are a grumpy grouch. But it comes from being uh, a foreigner in Japan. Yeah, sure. and also being hot all the time. Ooh. I'm sorry to hear that. And hitting my head on doorways and stuff like that. Ah, <laughs> uh, yes. Japanese people are short. Mm. No, Japanese people do it too. These doors are ridiculous. <laughs> the doors are just small. Yeah, no old reason. houses, doors, like normal Japanese people can't walk through them without hitting their head. I don't understand it. So, okay, totally off topic. But well, well, no, now, now I'm interested. Is that a recent genetic change, or were they actually built shorter than the people who were using them at the I time? I don't know about that that question, honestly. But all I know is everybody yeah. I know who lives in an old house. I'm talking old house. Yeah. 
they have to bend at the waist to go through their door as well. The children well, I, are fine. I, su- I suppose since it's traditional to uh, to bow when greeting someone in Japan. Yeah, maybe this was just uh, an expedience thing. Forcing forcing people to bow as they enter your house. Yeah, it's like, well, um, it's a win-win. We can make the door shorter. Yeah. And, yeah, I don't know. And it'll be harder. It'll be harder for someone to enter in an attack position. Right. Well, I do know the castles are uh, set if up. If you're like worried that. about that sort of thing, the, the yeah, tours on the castles are always really fancy. Like all the stairs go like basically straight up. They're almost ladders, <laughs> so like you just can't attack on an upward motion. Eighty percent grade. Yeah, it's just impossible. It's a lot to need stuff. Like all the doors are really low, so that you can't swing an axe and stuff. But that's Amazing. that's that's neither here nor there. <laughs> no. No. Um. Back to post-war Vienna. Uh, uh, this is the most noirish of noir films. Uh, yes, it is. I feel the, like I the, was watching what every noir film aspires to be. Oh, no, you really are. And in it's interesting, in watching this for the first time, even, if you've ever seen any other movie in existence, <laughs> well, you can, yeah, yeah. you're already partially familiar with The Third Man. You already... There are things that you swear are just a collective consciousness, but they started here. No, yeah, like, there's a lot of that kind of <clears throat> stuff, and then, like, I... Okay, well, let's not talk about the end, like, the the reveal <laughs> yet, but, yeah. Yes. Well... It felt like every, like, cop... Not cop, like, private eye mystery yes. I've ever seen, well, you know, he's, but he's, if you're the first to do it... They, <laughs> They didn't. They didn't originate the hard boiled detective in 1949, obviously. No. But they they uh, they reached the pinnacle of. <laughs> and you know he's not he's not hard boiled detective so much. He's he's a hack writer, an alcoholic so hack is, writer. You know I've never seen just, Castle. Yeah. Oh yes, but well, I'm sure Castle borrows a lot. I, it has uh, to, but, right? You know, at least at least the at least Castle. He's uh, he's a crime novelist. <laughs> Yes. Well, at least he actually knows what he's doing to a certain extent, but on top of that, uh, he's not constantly failing. <laughs> right. That's true. The, the the principle of this movie is that Holly uh, Martin's a, a man born to be murdered, according to Calloway. <laughs> One of my favorite lines in the movie <laughs> uh, is, is just really bad at it. And the only... Yeah, he solves the mystery, but in solving the mystery, uh, he thinks he's trying to solve a murder, but in really what he's doing is proving there wasn't a murder and getting his best friend arrested. Yeah, no, um, you know, this movie, to me, i just going to get out, seems like it is like two beats away from being a comedy. Oh, no, it is. Like, and the it, soundtrack it, really helps Yeah, it, it was like kind of watching, I was like, is this, am I supposed to laugh? Like, not in a negative way. It was not, like, because, like, it's so yeah. bad or something. It's just that it was, like, I feel like maybe <clears throat> I'm, away, I'm like, a few minutes away from some sort of weird Steve Martin thing happening. Well, well, Holly's character, I think, is a satire of the American hero. You know, he's, he's a uh, pulp western writer. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, no, I, yeah, sorry. I was just thinking about the fact but, that who like wanders around Vienna, ref- like just yeah. Do you speak English? Yes, yes, exactly. <laughs> um, Why don't you speak English? Only, I don't understand what you're saying. The only person who is a fan of his work uh, is introduced to him by punching him in the face <laughs> <laughs> for insulting a senior officer. Says says uh, you know every every time anyone talks about his writing and isn't isn't outright uh, degrading it. They're subtly degrading it. Uh, the first thing, you know, he says, oh, I've read a lot of your books. They're, I love westerns. You can pick them up and put them down without having to worry. Well, that's, you know, yeah. Because they, mean, the because they mean nothing. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, he's in, he ends up accidentally being invited to speak to the, uh, the uh, sort of Book Bureau Club. of the Arts. Yeah. The... the the arts club, the people, the cultural exchange program, uh, and they ask him about a bunch of questions centered in British no- British modernism novels. Um, and he's an American pop, pulp writer. He has, knows nothing about the death of the author, nothing about uh, James Joyce, nothing about any of the stream of consciousness ideas, and it's, he doesn't even know what the terms mean. 
and he calls himself a writer. But he's not a writer. He's just a guy. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, he's he's a writer by yeah. by definition, but yet not yes. an author. He he writes, but he's not an author. Um, and and in a really weird segue, I will say that this movie uh, is probably the very first we've seen in the Criterion Collection where the director is not some sort of auteur. Um, the director as auteur, the director as God, is a Truffaut idea, actually. Uh, we talk about it a lot now without without putting it back to Truffaut. Um, and a lot of a lot of the, a lot of times when I'm describing the Criterion Collection, I'll say I'll say that it's a collection of movies by people you would consider auteurs of some yeah. sort. But Carol Reed here, not really an auteur. Um, the it's very very heavily relied on the script, which was written by Graham Graham Greene. Um, it's it's really a collaboration, a true collaboration. Um, David Selznick, the producer, gave a lot of notes that were ignored, and Green and Reed have both said he's kind of philistine. <laughs> but the original ending to the novel or the novella that Graham Greene wrote as a script treatment, uh had Holly and Anna getting together. It was Selznick who suggested that she walk by him at the end of the movie. Which, I don't know if I would call him... If, if he cooked that up, I don't know if I would call him a, you know, a barbarian no. or a filthy... Like, that was no, no, a really that good... Is, that's a major is, element of the, the film. It undermines the happy ending, and it is a major element of the film. It, it cements her character... Uh, and and doesn't turn her into a woman foolishly. Uh, well, yeah, he doesn't, it doesn't turn her into like practically half the movies we have watched and half of the movies we yes, will watch. I know where exactly. The woman just has to end up with <coughs> with a man, with the hero. Yeah, that's that's how she defines, and she does define her life by her relationship with a man, a dead man, uh, well, that it, she refuses yeah. to get over. But at the same time, it's. It's her choosing that instead of choosing to pursue uh, a uh, an available uh, emotional connection. Um, so at least in that, she's her own person. Right, she makes so, yeah. Herself. Well, and especially at yeah. the end, you get that very willful choice. Yeah. Makes, yeah. Doesn't, and that's, a lot of what she does during the story, it wouldn't even matter if she was chasing after him. Because that ending, yeah. that's defines the character completely in and of itself yeah. anyway. Yeah. It puts it puts the nail on. Yeah, it. exactly. Um yeah. Uh there is talk, there has always been rumors that because of how it's shot and all the angles and how how the movie plays, that Orson Welles had a directorial hand in it. And that is that is like uh all the people who say William Shakespeare couldn't possibly have written the plays of Shakespeare, so it must have been yeah. Francis Bacon or Edward de Vere or any any of a handful of people. Uh, this couldn't have been Carol Reed because it's so Orson Welles. <laughs> uh, he did write the uh, the best speech of the movie, the uh, the cuckoo clock speech given in the at the uh, Ferris wheel, the you know, Italy five hundred years under the Bour- <laughs> Bourgeois. Uh, they had war and famine, and they produced Da Vinci and Michelangelo. In uh, in Switzerland, they had five hundred years of peace, and all they produced was the cuckoo clock. <laughs> such a such a great line, um, as he's justifying justifying his murder. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, but at the same time, you know he's he's comparing it. Uh, he's justifying it. We're just getting out of World War Two. And he says, "Look at look at all these dots down here. Are you telling me that you would care if one of the dots stopped moving? If someone offered you twenty thousand pounds to stop moving one dot, would you really, really uh, not take it?" And we're coming out of we're coming out of a time where life was so worthless. Right, but I think you if know. like so, when was the movie made? The movie was made in forty nine, and then but and it's, it's set, set in right. It's set post World War Two, so right? It's set, but like you know, just a couple and, years earlier, maybe. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. At the well, very so, most, like, a couple of he years. He says early. that, but at the same time, I would imagine at that time, that that line is really that that idea is added in there almost to make it even more dramatic because at oh, that I, point in I time, I bet. Think... Your view, movie-going audience is even more likely to reject that notion that. Well, yeah, I still think it's a villainous line. Well, it's a villainous line, but I what still I'm saying think... is, is like I think it's made more villainous by the setting the actual movie is being yeah. viewed in for the first time. If you tell a bunch of Americans in 1949 that killing people outright <laughs> for money is a good. thing thing, I think they're even more likely to reject it than they would yes. watching it. Yes. No, absolutely. But I still think I still think the filmmakers, the writer, producer, everyone is trying to sell the idea of that hypocrisy. That he is the bad guy while the good guys are the armies that are well, running the Yeah, I mean right there's now. another yeah, I mean that's <clears throat> who are responsible for so much more death. Right, right. That, I mean that's <clears throat> I definitely see what you're saying, and I agree. Yeah. But I also imagine that it's done to make you, every American audience member a little bit sick to their stomach when he says oh, it. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. No, I think you're right there, too. Um, part of the rumors for why, uh, or part of the fuel for the rumors of why Orson Welles uh, had a hand in directing this are the myriad of uh, Dutch angles used throughout the movie. Oh, which is he, something well, well, he, I, okay, I know he... Go on. In, uh, <laughs> in Citizen Kane, they used a lot of, a lot of Dutch yeah. angles like that that really... Uh, but and it really... Is, it was the pinnacle of Dutch angledom. Yeah, well, what I'm <laughs> but, saying uh, is that like that's like saying that like then my son's photo-taking skills are directly related to Orson Welles. <laughs> yes. Okay, well, yeah. Dutch angles um, are like... I know he uses all... It, that is well. There is there is the one point in the in the entire thing where it's where it's physically justified because we have one shot at Judge Angles because it's being shot from the point of view of the little bur- boy, right. the the son of the uh, the son of the porter who ends up murdered uh, because he talks too much. Uh, no, that happens to lots of porters. <laughs> I know, right? How uh, many how many would you say per anymore. week you lose, Adam? <laughs> at the hotel that I work for, we probably go through about a half dozen a day. <laughs> <laughs> Your hiring practices must be just madness. Yeah, it's it's really it's the only. Uh, it's weird. You really stop caring about their quality, and that probably adds to the to death the, toll. To the, yeah, right. Like I mean, you just have a queue um, outside. Yeah, yeah. But uh, uh sorry, I couldn't help it. It's just life. Life is worthless, isn't it? Um, especially I, for hotel no, quarters, but, apparently. One of the things, one of the things I noticed this time around that I'd never noticed before, uh, is that you know there's a lot of there's a lot of physical justification for those angles because a lot of times the angles are uh, crooked as representation of the city in ruin. Um, yeah. When they're outside in the ruins, uh, it's it's you know it's it's not even necessarily that they meant to do it on Dutch angles, but that's just. When they set up the camera, how, yeah, you're, if you build on sat. rubble, yeah, yeah, um, or try not that, not that, that I think, not that I think that they were accidental there. No, I mean, no. it's still a conscious choice. But I mean, but that um, just emphasizes the fact that like yeah. this area, this is chaos here. Yes, and and I think that the the camera angles definitely sell that chaos. Uh, and on the other hand, there is ideo- ideological justification. Um, there is only one character in the entire movie who is consistently shot with a straight frame. Did you notice who it was? No, I wasn't. This is a thing that I did not notice until this time watching. Calloway, the British officer. Oh, really? Every time he is on screen. Every time he is on screen and not talking to someone who is... Uh, every time it's just him on screen. Or just him and his men on screen. Or even just him and Holly on screen. It's squarely shot. Huh. Fascinating. Uh, <clears throat> except for one instance. And what's the instance? So Cal- Calloway is the basis for truth throughout the entire movie. He's the only one who is saying what is real, even though we don't trust him. Because we're we're with Holly. Well, for, right. For I mean, the, the, movie. the movie does a good job of selling us that this is yeah. our hero. Despite yeah. how laughable yes. his career is. 
He, yes. he is um, investigating this murder, and everybody's hiding things from him. And it's kind of one, it's a nice one scene with Holly and Calloway when they're at the children's hospital, and Calloway is using the kids who we never see. We see the, their effects. We see that obviously they're in pain and dying. We never actually see the children, but he's using those kids as leverage to get Holly to turn on Harry to turn him in, to join the conspiracy to get him arrested. And that is the only time that Calloway, when he's being coercive in that manner... Right, the, when he's no longer so, just... So overtly coercive. Yeah. yeah, Not just pursuing justice, but actually yeah. trying to make it happen. <clears throat> yes. Hmm. Uh, is the only time he's shot that I noticed. I, I'll, I'll admit I could be wrong. It would be almost worth but, going. I mean, we're obviously not going to do it, but it would be almost worth going through again. <laughs> yeah, and like really I started keeping track of it, like with. Paper I started to notice. I started to notice pretty earlier, pretty early on, that that seemed to be happening. So I made a point to pay attention to it uh, throughout the movie, and that is that is ultimately the conclusion I found. Huh. Um, we mentioned earlier, really briefly, that the the soundtrack. Uh, the soundtrack also lends a sort of comedic take to it, being all Zither music. Uh, and on the idea that this is a collaboration and not an all-tour movie, uh, I'll point out that uh, uh, the guy who did the Zither music, uh, Karis is his last name, I can't remember his first name, um, they found him on location. They really? went to start filming the movie. They had an idea for an orchestral soundtrack, and they found him playing in a coffee shop in Vienna and said, oh, we should use some of that. So they did the opening theme, uh, and he did some other music that they were going to work in. And then as Reed was having the movie edited in London, he thought, you know what? I really like the Zither music. Not so keen on the orchestra that we now have recorded uh, and invited Karas to London to stay at his house. And record a soundtrack wow, for the next. That's for the fascinating. Rest of the movie. Yeah. Huh. Like I mean, the music works. It it just it yeah. makes just this ever so like it, slightly pratfally feeling sometimes. Yeah, I like it. It, it I like adds it. it adds this weird sense to what's going on because because it is a little pratfally and Holly's pratfally in how he does things, but and, and you know the zither is a very light airy sort of well not airy airy makes it sound mysterious like a pipe organ uh, but it's a yeah, it's a light it's like, sort yeah. of plucky guitar sound and it's it's not it's not something that normally you would think of as this dark well yeah and, uh, and it's like, not dark like line but, trying to line it up with this sort of yeah this noir aesthetic is yeah yeah but but the fact that it's not dark uh, and the the irony of it not being dark, I suppose, uh, just m- ratchets it up the mood. Like you know, in in that famous speech, uh, Wells ends the cuckoo clock. <laughs> you know, the the merit of war speech, and then says goodbye and steps off as the zither starts again from silence and he's just hopping away into his merry little world of diluting medicine into to the point where it kills people yeah yeah it, it, <laughs> yeah it kind of it's interesting yeah when it's matched up with the villain because with it's when it's matched up with Holly it almost makes sense because he's so laughably bad at this yeah. um this investigation but when it's matched up with what is ostensibly our villain who is yeah. evil um he it's it makes it a totally different feeling right because like when it matches up with holly it's kind of oh this guy is kind of just a buffoon a little bit and when it matches up with the villain it's just emphasizes how <laughs> villainous he is yes that, like he can be paired exactly. up with this light music that is not at all his personality or anything like that. So. Well, yeah. I mean, even even in as much as we know that Harry Lyme is a villain, he is still that fun guy that Holly grew up with. Right. You know, he's 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 uh, 
he's Eddie Haskell. <laughs> he's Eddie Haskell at the <laughs> when Eddie Haskell becomes an adult and it's just kept escalating. <laughs> right. He's he's the guy who can lie to get out of anything. He's he's the kid you grew up with uh, who thinks it would be funny to. Uh, I don't know, fork someone's lawn. Um, it's, or dilute you know, it's, penicillin yeah. until it becomes... No. Well, it seems it seems harmless until it's done on a massive scale. Well, right, and then, um, like, also just is incapable of, like, really considering yeah. the consequences of his actions kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. And at the, also, it's, you know, it's Orson Welles. It's, right. <laughs> you know, you can't... You can't sell him as a villain. He's he's just you know not that he doesn't do it well, and not I mean in Citizen Kane he certainly has menace, um, but he's still uh, just a very kiddish looking handsome man. Yeah, you know he's he's got the looks of a con artist because he can sell anything to you. Uh, so I don't know where I was going with that, um, <laughs> but no. What I mean, what I mean to say music is, in general, like well, yeah. What I mean to say is, is that the music fits him because it's surprising. It's not what you expect from from the rest of everything, um, and it's not what you expect. Or this character is not what you expect when meeting Harry Lime, right? You know. Well, especially um, like yeah, like. Especially because at this point we've already gotten the descriptions of his deeds and yeah, so yeah, and like you're expecting yeah. some hard-boiled like criminal element yeah. that you get in every yeah, movie exactly. where it's like ah oh, the bad guy. Well, where's his limp and his scar and his <laughs> exactly half like two days growth of beard. <laughs> Why why doesn't he have an eye? <laughs> right, going exactly. Where, where's the, if the thin if he's mustache? Living, if he's living on the run, you know, but he's still completely clean shaven and clean and, and dressed yeah. well. Like running through How a man with money. Those, yeah. Yes. Um, Orson Welles was apparently a terror on this set. Uh, they had originally, uh, there were a lot of other people up for the role. Uh, uh, and who was it? Noel Coward was going to be in Wells' role, and uh, David Niven was up for uh, Holly at one point, um, which would have been a very different movie, I think. Uh, but David Selznick, the producer, had Joseph Cotton on contract, so he went with him. <laughs> and uh, uh, I think it was Reed who insisted on using Orson Welles, and it was ultimately a decision I bet Reed regrets. Welles got there and refused to go in the sewers. Uh, really? So all of those sewer, all of those sewer shots, which, you know, legitimately, the suspiciously sa- <laughs> spacious sewers yeah. of Vienna do legitimately exist, but all of those shots of Welles in those sewers, set pieces. Really? He refused to go in the sewer. Um... The shot toward the end, right before uh, Holly uh, confronts Harry in the sewer and Harry mouths, kill me, and Holly shoots him. Um, the very poignant end to to Harry's existence. Uh, he is trying to get out of the sewer by lifting a grate, right. and his fingers are coming through this grate. Those are not Orson Welles' fingers, because that would require he refused to go him to be in the, in the sewer. sewer. That would require him to be in the sewer. Those are actually Carol Reed's hands coming through the grate. The director himself standing in for his star because his star <laughs> refused to God <laughs> refused to do it. So, uh, yeah, uh, apparently he wasn't fun to work with at this point. Um, yeah, it would seem not. <laughs> yeah, and that's you know the other half of of this rumor that Orson Welles was really behind the most brilliant aspects of this movie. Uh, so maybe those stories are are uh, Reed trying to say, well, it wasn't him; he was just this bastard. Um, but at the same time, it's it's very clearly Reed's hands. That's that's kind of there aren't they're not Wells' hands, but uh, <laughs> but yeah, it's 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 just very it's a very interesting history in the movie that it it came together the way it did. Um, Green set out to write this movie. Uh, he had had an idea uh, of a line that said, essentially, the opening uh, 
the opening narration, which is Reed reading that uh, that opener about post-war Vienna. Um, but there's a line in it, or there's a line Green came up with, uh, just a fragment of an idea. Uh, Harry had been dead a week before I got to Vienna, or whatever he said. The Mar- and he Marley told- was dead to begin with. <laughs> Well, yeah. Well, I mean, at the at the same time, so so we had this this fragment of an idea about a character who was thought to be dead but wasn't, and he was contracted to write a film that could be shot in Vienna and Rome. Uh, oh, that makes sense. Yeah, I know. He, and he ended up shooting one wholly in in Vienna, but he, uh, yeah, it's it's. Every every individual aspect of this movie seems to have come from somewhere else, but it all comes together so wonderfully well. Well, uh, but that, I mean that's really the way it is in a lot of like especially the ones that are not the result of some overwhelming well, auteur yeah. is just like oh, we just accidentally made an awesome movie. <laughs> yes. It just sort of happened. And I don't, I don't want to no, pretend that, that I don't no, think I mean, that like, anyone here was, you know, was think, capable of making something like this. What I mean like is, like, this, when you add in, like, the Ziffer, a Zither music and stuff like that, like, these sort of happy coincidences that go into a lot of movies when they turn yeah. out great. I mean, there's a million movies that turn out bad because those happy coincidences just didn't happen yeah. or come together right. They didn't come together right. And, you know, I mean, uh, not to downgrade, or, you know, degrade the work of any individual in this process. They just, you know, it's the way it is, right? Yes. And I think most collaborative efforts kind of works out that way. Uh, so, the other thing I noticed for the first time in this movie, and this is something we'll either talk to uh, talk for about... 30 seconds on, or we could spend the next half hour dissecting. Okay. Uh, I never noticed that Harry's two friends, the guy with the bow tie and the fur coat and the dog, and the doctor, uh, his personal doctor, Uh who Holly goes to visit and the dog is at his apartment, never put it together that they're gay. Really? I have watched this so many times, and I never even thought of it. Uh... I found an I essay didn't think online about that at all after, either. Well, I, fa- I found an essay online after I started thinking about this that, that talked about coding and uh, the way that a uh, homosexual character was projected uh, in, in Hayes Goat's times and, and pre, pre-times where that would have been acceptable on screen. Um, and obviously one way of doing that is, is high fashion. So just the fact that the guy... the the one guy is in the fur coat and bow tie and, and carrying a little dog. Um, but what's what got me thinking about them being a couple is the scene where Holly goes to see the doctor. Mm-hmm. I had always I had always thought was just trying to sell a conspiracy because the dog is there, and then he asks if there's anyone else, and the doctor says no, no one else is here. So I thought it was just selling a conspiracy that obviously this other gentleman is here. Right. But the dog isn't just there. The doctor, uh, the doctor commands the dog, as if the dog sees him as as an authority as much as its own owner. I did not so think it, of that. Yeah. So it suggests that, that there's more to it there. And then later, um, there's a scene uh, where they're overlooking the action from a balcony. Uh, I think it's when Holly goes back to the apartment and is everyone thinks that he's uh, murdered the porter. Mm-hmm. They're they're overseeing that action from the balcony, and they're both in their pajamas. Um, huh. And on top of that, as they turn to go back in the house, the doctor puts his hand in the middle of the other gentleman's back and sort of leads him in. So are um, we both so just blind, or...? I had never noticed it before, um, and, and and yeah, in, in I didn't way, notice it's not it. Something I'm, I'm looking so not. for. It's not something I'm looking uh, looking for. I watched this with one of my roommates who's who's gay, and uh, talked to him about it afterward, and he said, "Oh yeah, no, the balcony scene was certainly what sold it, it sold me on that." Um, so it's not. It, it might just be that it's not something I thought to look for uh, in my in my heteronormative. <laughs> 
view of view of film of the time. Hmm. Um, but uh, at the same time, it's also very subtly done. You know, this isn't this isn't something that they could have broadcast in a way. I mean, they can't have two guys kissing right on and, screen and in yeah, and yeah, absolutely not. So, <clears throat> um, but still, like I, I now I feel somewhat embarrassed that I didn't notice it. Yeah, yeah, I know, right? Um, and and then on the one hand, yeah, they're the bad guys, but their their homosexuality has nothing to do. It's it's not the depraved homosexual uh, stereotype that starts popping up later when we get when we get this this anti. Uh, it's all gays or pedophiles, sort of. Yeah, that yeah you see later, and yeah, uh, that starts to pop up, you know. But so yeah, they're they're bad guys to an extent, but they're but not, as bad guys. They're, as yeah, they're not. Bad um, guy. They're not bad guys because they're homosexual. They're just yeah. bad guys. They're they're bad they're bad guys because they're associated with Harry. Right. You know, we don't we don't have any suggestion that they're any worse than Harry, and Harry is still this entertaining bad guy, and these guys are. Are entertaining enough. They don't have a lot of screen time, uh, even compared to Harry. They don't have a lot of screen time, which is weird. Um, <laughs> a man who's dead for the, most of the film. Yeah, yeah. Well, well, the introduction, you know, on those characters, the introduction to the Bowtie guy. We really wish I could remember their names. Uh, Doctor Doctor Winkle is the doctor's name yes. because uh, Holly calls him Winkle, and it's a little joke. Um, and you know, maybe that's maybe that's part of the coding too. <laughs> I, well, okay, yeah, I don't know. Um, but, <laughs> really, we can start reading a yeah, lot. Yeah, if we start hunting we, for coding, we, this is going to get absurd. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And then it's just going to um, make us look bad. But yeah, I mean, carrying a small dog has always been has always been gay coding too for a very long time. So, but but it's it's part of the high fashion, you know, to own a dog that you have to carry is a it's an aristocracy sort right, of thing. Right, right. You own the most useless animal ever to come into existence. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. I'm so but, rich but that when I that have guy's... to carry my dog. Or actually, I have to get this when guy Ho- to carry my dog. <laughs> yes. When when the uh, yeah when Holly first meets him and he's carrying the uh, he's carrying uh, the copy of one of Holly's books and he says something to the extent of uh, the suspense in the books being so so great. You finish a chapter and you don't know where it's going to go next. Um, not only is sort of foreshadowing to the movie, but also is another dig at Holly's writing abilities because he doesn't know what, right, <laughs> what right, the guy's right, talking about as far as suspense goes. It's not a thing he was trying to do. Uh, you don't know where the story's going next because Holly's just that bad a writer. Right. So Holly probably doesn't know <laughs> he, where the story's going next. Exactly. exactly. So yeah, just another another fun little di- yeah. That this movie makes fun of Holly so much, yeah. you know. Calloway and and Holly eventually accepts that he's a sad sack at the very end. Calloway's last line to him is to be sensible when he talks about uh, saving the girl, and he wants to be dropped off so that he can uh, he can walk back to town with with her, and she walks on by. But as Calloway says, "Be sensible, Holly." <laughs> Holly Martin says, I haven't got a sensible name. Because he doesn't. What kind of name is Holly Martin's? <laughs> yeah. Um, he's got he's got a traditionally girl's first name and a last name that's plural for no reason. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, it's... Although, uh, it happens. It, well, it's yeah, not, no, it's, I... an, it's not an absurdly improbable name. The Holly part's no, a little it's bit not. improbable, but... It's... It's not for, for perfect or perfect. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's, uh, well, you know what I mean. We've all read yeah. and heard in movies more improbable names, but it's it's yeah. His name is even just a little prat folly. Yes, to emphasize exactly. just yes. how much a kind of a goofball he is. Yeah, without being he's like a, he's not a comedic act, but he is. He's a punchline. Yeah. He's, he's Everybody not the whole can joke. dig on him. He's just yeah. the punchline. And and by no means is he what what uh, I think uh, TV tropes refers to as the butt monkey. You know, he's not he's not necessarily what a do guy they call who it? only exists. Butt monkey, the the guy who's always the butt of the joke. Oh, okay. Um, so he is kind of that, but he's also he's not that in in a sort of overt way because he's still our protagonist. Well, yeah, and he doesn't just yeah he's not wandering around just providing comedic. Uh, yeah, he's not just wandering around providing punchlines. He is still progressing the story. Yeah. And he gets bit by a parrot, and even he can't believe he got hit bit by a parrot. 
<laughs> what kind of guy running running from from thugs in Vienna ends up getting bit by a parrot? Um, Holly Martins is that like kind of guy? Yes, yeah, exactly <laughs> that kind of guy. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, it's it's. What haven't we talked about that I love? The pacing of this movie is great. Yes. You know, it's it's boom, boom, boom. It keeps it keeps everything flowing, uh, and it puts you right in the middle of the mystery. And, well, and it's and really it weird you... because I wonder a little bit to myself. Okay, we have a twist, uh-huh. and it got me, and I'm yeah. quite. As an American man who has seen more than one M. Night Shyamalan movie, I'm prepared for twists. <laughs> yes. Uh, but no, it really got me, so I'm really kind of... I'm always impressed when a movie that has been around for a pretty long time can mm-hmm. surprise me. I mean, obviously, I could have gone read Wikipedia or something and just known what well, happened. Yeah. But it was it, it didn't tip its hand in a way that was obvious to me too early. Because we've watched some other mystery movies where I was like, oh, okay. I know who's... In fact, it wasn't that long ago we watched something where I was... I just knew what was going to happen or who the bad guy was just almost immediately. But this one Uh didn't give it away because I was still hunting for, like, how we were going to find the murder, the third man. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the, the the only other movie I can think of that we really had a good twist in... And I hope this isn't what you're thinking about, Rob, is uh, Diabolique. No, 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 no. Uh, it certainly was, didn't. It was, I don't know if it was a twist, or I just... Uh, I can't remember. It was a while back. Just, yeah. The listeners yeah. probably know. Um, because I'm sure they, <laughs> they remember everything. Sure. Um, no, yeah. it's... It, this one is just... This one didn't... It didn't seem obvious yeah. to me from the very get-go. I mean, it... You know, you start getting ideas yeah. about, but we are getting. Yeah. By the time well, you start think, getting ideas, you're so close to the reveal anyway that it's yes. hard to separate whether or not. Yeah, this movie. I mean. This movie hinges on the hinges on that twist, but it doesn't. It's not. Here's the twist. Here's the end. Hey. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's not and like Di- Diabolique obviously does that, but it does it because it's a horror movie, and the twist, <laughs> the reveal of the horror is. Is is that right? You know, right. M. Night Shyamalan does that because the twist is the period at the end. Yeah, it's basically the end. Yeah, it's the <clears throat> yeah. This this the isn't the, the period. It's right. It's just it's part of the story. The turning. Well, into and that's the third what act. I think. It's, and the difference is, is that's what makes this probably for you. I mean, I would know yet, but makes it rewatchable. Is that the twist yeah. is not essential for the enjoyment of the the experience. It's just an essential part of the story. Yeah, is what and the fact, that, the fact that I can watch this movie for probably the two dozenth time in my life and still be noticing things, uh, you know, maybe says something to the fact that I'm not always <laughs> I'm not nearly as observant <laughs> as I like to pretend I am. Well, but um, I mean, which which I'll admit for for those two characters being gay, um, but you know, as as far as the the angles selling that Calloway is telling the truth. I mean, I think that's that's something that in any amount of casual viewing, you're not going well, to... Well, yeah, especially watch. if you're not hunting for the details. Like, I mean, the way yeah. we have to view film, like these films now, is a little bit different than we would normally watch them, so... Well, yeah, yeah, true. True as well. But, I mean, but those are... I mean, we we said that this um, director is not an auteur, but doesn't mean that he didn't... Doesn't mean that he's not Yeah, good. exactly. That's yeah. what I mean. Yeah, he... I mean, that, that angles thing is something you probably subconsciously picked up on every time you watch the movie. Yeah. You just didn't yeah. bother to, to, <laughs> to take enough notes <laughs> like while well, you're watching to keep yeah. track of it until you actually had to. But I'm sure your well, mind yeah, took I mean, it into account because you see a crooked screen the, you think something is wrong. Yeah. After the first time, after the first time seeing this movie, I would say, this is a great movie. Forcing me to articulate why it's a great movie can eventually get me to these points. Right, right. You start thinking harder and harder about it. Yeah, yeah. But I, I know as a gut reaction that this is a good movie. I react to this. I'd say, oh, it's well, great. Well, I mean, I throwing the fact that sometime. the story is engaging and yeah. good means that, yeah. I mean, yeah, maybe when you're articulating, you won't mention the weird angles on certain characters versus the straight yeah. angle on another character in your personal analysis of it but 
if you go yeah. hunting for it, I'm sure, like you said, like it's a gut reaction. You probably notice those things somewhere subconsciously and said, "Oh, this is always this guy's always crooked." You know, this guy is crooked, They're, or this like this world, this scene is distorted, wrong, something like that. So. Yes, yes. There's a there's also a uh, a sort of uh, very easy reading of this movie that that points it as just a a coming of age tale for Holly, a very late in life coming of age tale. But but up until this point, he's been a boy. And this is the movie that turns him into an adult. Okay, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Gets him to stop viewing things as a child, which is true. But I think it's it's again it's 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 the level one of of a multi level. Well, right, movie. and that's like I mean, golly, you could call almost every movie a coming of age tale. If yes, you want exactly. To, if I you're mean, going if you're going to define it that loosely, yeah, it's I mean. <laughs> I think there's a reason why we don't apply that to practically every movie where someone ma- like changes or matures on a personal level. Yeah. Um, yeah. But no, I mean, there's a. But it's good that it happens. Well, I mean, know, yeah, your character everyone, needs to progress. So yeah, you know, no one's really. There's not a lot of flat characters in this. But it also and, makes me wonder what is. <laughs> I don't want this to be in the movie, but it makes me wonder about Holly's next five years, like. Has he matured beyond writing Pulp Fiction? Well, in in an interesting thing on that note, uh, but the opposite of that note in a way, <laughs> uh, the uh, this movie was turned a very early movie to establish a sort of franchise oh, idea. Really? Uh, after this movie was produced, Orson Welles and Mercury Radio uh, did The Adventures of Harry Lyme, a young Harry. So they, uh, okay, I know because they got series. Orson Welles on board, but Harry <clears throat> Lime, really? Yes, they did. They they thought that he was such an interesting character, and he is an interesting character. But uh, he's that still they a wanted bad to show guy. his character history. If yes, you know how it ends up. He's the adventurous bad guy. I so. know, but still, like, I don't know if I want to listen to a story that I know ends in a man who gives, well, ch- like, allows children to die from men- meningitis and then, uh,. You know, is just generally a kind of a scumbag in a certain and con artist and stuff. I don't know that that, that really. I I'm sorry. Yeah. This news is upsetting. Have you listened well, to I'm it? Sorry to hear that. I have not. You should find it. I I haven't. We'll do a special I haven't even looked for a copy of it. <laughs> I kind of don't want to imagine what Maybe it would be should. like. Well, I'm sure it's very fun. Yeah. I actually misspeak to... I don't actually know that it was my Mercury Radio that, that did it, I suppose. <laughs> well, I, I'm sure it was fun, but that's all the more upsetting, Adam. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> no, I mean, it's just... Yeah, I can't imagine, but... Well, especially since it would come out... It came out after the film. Yes. Everybody who saw after. the movie... Knows how this guy ends up, and is like, you know what? I could really go for like a sort of Dennis the Menace kind of thing with this evil, evil man. Yes, yes. <laughs> it's uh, well, I assume I guess it wouldn't be Dennis the Menace. Yes, it would be somewhere old enough that Orson Welles could play the <laughs> main character. But you know. I'm sorry the the Harry the the Harry Lime Wikipedia article does not actually mention the radio series. Uh oh, which I think is very very odd. Well, didn't it also say like uh, mention that like the movie he wrote a novel the was it Gr- was his name Graham Green Green, Green Graham, Graham Green. Graham Green. Uh, I couldn't decide if it was Green Graham or Graham Green. Um, I can't yeah. speak English now either. Um, so. He wrote a novella as a treatment for the script and then wrote the actual book after the movie, right? I think I read that. He, uh... I may be wrong. The novella... The book was released, and this is... Whatever Wikipedia says, this is the actual truth. Um, The book was written basically just as a script treatment. Right, I understand that. Um... So the the book existed in collaboration with the movie, but it was written as the first draft. Well, I mean, the first publishable draft. 
uh, of the movie. Um, <clears throat> I finally found uh, information on the radio series. It was called The Adventures of Harry Lyme in Britain and broadcast in the U.S. as The Lives of Harry Lyme. It was produced in Britain, but uh, Wells did do the voice. Uh, 52 episodes aired from 1951 uh, through 1952, uh, several of which Wells wrote. Um, uh, one of which is... Oh, I did listen to the one, because it was on my Criterion Collection DVD, huh. uh, Ticket to Tangiers. Um, so yeah, I have listened to one. I completely forgot about that. Uh, but yeah, so they exist. <laughs> <laughs> That's a thing that is... Um, a television series, a television version of uh, the Third Man, uh, ran for five seasons, started in 1959. What? 77 episodes with uh, Michael Rennie as Harry Lyne. Um, Arthur Hiller directed six episodes. Uh, very interesting. Wait, so it's um, it's the, it's not it's the Third Man. So, yeah, well, it's called The Third Man, but it's got to be just be The, the Adventures of Harry Lyme. That's what I'm wondering. I mean, it's like, do we not have a Hollywood? You can't have the plot. You can't have the plot of this spread out to 77 episodes. That's I disagree entirely. <laughs> I watch a lot of modern American television. And as far as I can tell, you can drag a mystery out four, five, <laughs> ten seasons. Well, yeah, especially if it's getting good reason uh, ratings. Exactly, uh, like that that mystery you can could, go on you forever. Have... There'll be polar bears, all kinds of crazy. Ah, <laughs> uh, sorry, you know no, I've never the third man really needs. Show. I watched one the episode. third man really. Um, the third man really needs a smoke monster. <laughs> yeah, right. It's exactly. True. Like all I know is the um, same pop, pop culture crap about it that everybody else knows. I've never even I saw one episode. I was like, this is just. Not I saw one episode thing. too. Um. Yeah, yeah, I wasn't too into it. Um, frequent frequent collaborator with us though, uh, um, <laughs> my my former roommate. Uh, you just for, you just forgot your roommate, a, your former. Roommate. I forgot Stephen's name for a second. My former roommate Stephen, uh, who has who has been on a number of episodes, is a huge fan of Lost, and I'm sure that if he were part of this conversation, he would be berating us right now. <laughs> uh, well, you know, to each their own, right? Um, so yes. you were so they did a TV show, and it's. It's, it's called, called the third, the third man, but it's really just the stories of Harry Lyme because you can't have yes. them both on screen throughout a TV show when we know that the ending is <laughs> yes, this like exactly. two uh, this that hour and a half really block dead. where he's not dead. Yeah. Hmm. So why didn't they just call it the Adventures of Harry Lyme like they did the radio show? I wonder. I I don't know. I guess the third man must have had some like cachet, like the name. Of the, like the, the yeah. film title must have carried some weight. Well, yeah. If the if the TV show started in uh, when did it start? Sixty one. I, I thought you said no. No, it, it started in fifty nine. So ten years after. Um, and this is a time where pop culture moved a little slower than it does today. So um, right, the, not not with the memes and such. Yeah. But, the, but yeah. well, see, I, I guess, well, I guess if you were an adult when The Third Man came out, you would still just be a TV-watching adult in 1959, who would be interested in, you would remember that story that you saw and enjoyed and be like, oh, I should watch that, so, makes sense, I guess. Well, well, here, here's an interesting note, uh, not necessarily on the movie, we've talked a lot, uh, I think I... A couple of weeks ago, we talked about uh, the, uh, oh, what was the name of that movie? <laughs> I don't know what you're talking about, Adam. <laughs> I don't know the topic, the one that went into uh, The one that went into public domain immediately because they forgot to put the copyright oh, notice on. Is that the, the crazy was, one that uh, I didn't like? Carnival of yes. Souls. Carnival of Souls. Um yeah, that was that was last week's episode. Well, uh, not <laughs> what it was. They, they know by now that we don't. We've well, we've we've waited a few weeks be, between recording these two episodes, so that's why I couldn't remember. Uh, but uh, this movie was actually in the public domain because the copyright was not renewed when David Selznick died in ninety. Uh, uh, well, when he died, yeah, uh, but don't, in nineteen ninety six, he died in. Get this the real quick. power of the internet. 65. He died in 65. He was super young. 
Mm. Um, That's sad. Very, was, well, he was 63, actually. Oh, never mind. He wasn't well, he, super he, young so long as that was a super long time ago. <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, the uh, the International uh, Copyright Agreement, uh, the Uruguay Round Agreement Act, um, well, copyright is part of it, uh, actually reinstituted the copyright on this. So it was in the public domain uh, from his death until 1996. How, can you... And then can they do that? I don't... I don't think that's legal. Um, this is. Well, then this you is could just walk around where, willy-nilly adding copyright to whatever the hell you feel like. like. <laughs> this oh, is wow. this is a point where it would be where it would be useful to have uh, to have Stephen here uh, because he would know. Yeah, he, would. he would know a little more about these laws. Uh, he would still be berating us for our opinions on laws. Right, we wouldn't even be having this conversation right get, now. <laughs> no, no. But uh, but yeah, it was it was out of copyright for for many years, and then we put it back into copyright and. Under current law, which of course will change because that's how U.S. copyright law <laughs> works, yeah. uh, it's set to enter the public domain in 2045. Oh my gosh! Um, well, thank goodness that a lot of people don't seem to notice or care. <laughs> no, and right. I was able to watch it um, on YouTube. Um, so, <laughs> did you watch it on YouTube? Yeah, I had to. I rented. I rented well, it. What's out of uh, print? I rented it from. Well, I rented it from. Uh, Amazon. It was on Amazon. Oh, no, I ran... You're right. Sorry. I made a mistake. I watched this one on Amazon. I think... I think I'm you, thinking you of another film. Watched one yeah. of the other yeah, one of the other films. Sorry, I got myself confused. If you're somebody yeah. who's planning on suing me for watching something on YouTube, it shouldn't have been up there. <laughs> I watched this on you Amazon. You did, in fact, pay I for this I did, in fact, one. pay yes. for this. Yes. Yes. Uh, and I'm sure you have the receipts to yes. prove it. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. Um, I keep a bug file in a notebook. <laughs> yes. In my All right. Well, I think unless there's anything else you specifically have to say, no, I think we're about no. Like I said, I wasn't able to give this the attention I wanted to, and I think I've got to go back and rewatch it because you really should. Yeah, some of the things you were mentioning, I picked up on, but not as well. Like they weren't as yeah. clear in my mind, and so they started to sort of resolve themselves when you mentioned them. So I'm thinking, I need to go back and watch this. This seems like a good Saturday afternoon. Like I'm home alone. Yeah film to watch so i'll probably do it so it's a it's a very good movie like i said it's one of my favorite movies i regret selling it uh but i don't regret uh getting kicked out of my apartment that, I, that month, I somewhat so. regret <laughs> that i rented it rather than bought it because i'm gonna have to rent it again yes. that is true and that's another two dollars yeah. hey oh. man every two dollars counts so i know I right know you had do. to sell your that's copy cool. of the third man in order to eat dinner <laughs> I, I understand i know they do <laughs> There are things I've done. Uh, mostly involve selling, mostly involve selling uh, pieces of uh, piece of of culture that I regret selling. Mm-hmm. I, I sold my complete works of Shakespeare for a hundred dollars to make rent one month while I was out of work. Uh, that was years ago, though. I really need to rebuy that. I actually have the money right now to rebuy. You that. should. You should do that. Anyway, uh, next week special treat. Uh, we're watching Rushmore, Wes Anderson's nineteen ninety eight, his uh, his second movie. Uh, and we have a big group of people yeah, together it's to a, watch it with it's us. It's a party. Um, it is a party. We've got uh, Donovan Hill, uh, who has talked with us before. Uh, we've got our old friend Amanda Morant. Uh, we've got who has never uh, been Jonathan on the show Hape. before, and neither has she's Jonathan. never been on the show. Jonathan Hayes also never been on the show, but he does do our our uh, theme music, uh, and he is a big Wes Anderson fan as well as his wife is a large. Wes she's not a large fan. Wes Anderson fan. Well, she's she. she I mean, we're getting confused. No, not, I don't want to imply. I don't want to imply. She's, she's actually a woman. quite she's a normal actually, sized she, woman. Yes, she's very normal size. She is. She is not twelve feet tall or, or anything. <laughs> or like any that. other sort of implications um, of calling her a large yeah. fan. <laughs> yeah, no, she's a big fan of, of Wes Anderson as well, and she'll be joining as well, Casey Hape. Um, so, uh, yeah, that'll be fun, um, and. We'll see you then. Yep, see you next time. Thanks for listening. Bye. Bye.
You've been listening to Lost in Criterion, a production of With Two Brains. The show is hosted by Adam Glass and John Patrick Oatari Dorgan. Jonathan Hape did the music, and Adam Glass also edited it all together. Feel free to contact us by email via lostincriteria at withtwobrains.com or join us on the web at www.